But hello, everyone, and um, welcome to those of you who are in the UK, and a really spectacular welcome to um, our speakers who are joining us from the not so sunny, um, slightly grey California. <laughs> Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Helen Crosser and I'm founder of Brilliant Beginnings and one of the owners of our sister organization, NGA Law. Um, and I'm just so delighted that um, you can all join us today. Um, we're um, going to be looking at surrogacy uh, in the US and in particular some of the implications um, around uh, what is going on in our current um, pandemic. Um, as this is being recorded, today is April the 20th, um, oh no it's not, April the 30th, 2020. Um, I wanted just to remind you all, uh, if you haven't already, just go ahead and, and um, mute your microphone um, and just set your view to speaker view. As I said, it is being recorded. Um, there is um, going to be an opportunity where we will share the recording with everybody afterwards. Um, but at the same time, you may well have questions. And for those of you who are comfortable with Zoom, there is a little chat box um, at the bottom of your screen in the middle. Um, and please do feel free at any point to um, post questions and we'll make sure that we um, get to those at the end of, of um, all of the speakers. Um, so by all means, just put things up um, as you think of them so that you, you don't forget. In the meantime, um, let's turn to our amazing speakers. Um, so we're joined today from California um, um, by Amy Kaplan, who runs West Coast Surrogacy. Um, and Amy's going to talk to us through the surrogacy, around the surrogacy process from the agency perspective. Um, we're also really delighted to have Dr. Saeed Danishatman and Dr. Sandy Chuan from San Diego Fertility, who are going to look, cover the, the clinical perspective. And finally, from there, we're going to move on to the legal landscape. Um, and we're joined with Rich Vaughan, um, who is an attorney based in LA. And then from the UK perspective, Natalie Gamble, um, who is uh, my lovely business partner. So firstly, let's turn to Amy. Um, Amy started her career in reproductive medicine and has um, been devoted to that sector since the 19 um, since 1980 when she started out at the Southern California IVF Center. Um, while Stanley was there, she became practice manager and was instrumental in developing uh, their donor embryo program. And really, found having found her passion, she then went on to set up West Coast Surrogacy and Egg Donation Agency. And, you know, she and her team simply help, help hundreds of families come together through surrogacy. Um, Amy's a member of, of the ASRM, Seeds, Resolve, and Live Strong. And not only that, but she is also a trained doula. So I'm going to hand over to you, Amy. Um, and Thank you. Um, let's hear about uh, things from your side. Great. Thank you so much, Helen and Stephen and everyone at Brilliant Beginnings for having us. And thank you to all of you for welcoming us into your home this evening. And I hope you're all staying healthy and, and sane during this time. Um, as Helen mentioned, I have been in this um, field for, for most of my life. And I've been a surrogate and an egg donor myself. And our, our team is, we're a family-owned business. I work with my son. And uh, our team is comprised of all men and women who have been personally touched by surrogacy or egg donation. So we're... We're here to um, continue helping you create your families and share our passions uh, in a unique way rather than being surrogates or donors ourselves anymore. And so we, we've been, we just celebrated our 13th birthday actually this month. And so surrogacy, I'll, I'll talk about surrogacy in the US. And initially, so the first steps are interviewing agencies and IVF centers. So speaking with <clears throat> San Diego Fertility Center, with uh, with ourselves, with, with other agencies, and identifying the team that you'd like to work with. So those are your first steps. We, of course, have consultations. Even throughout COVID, we're all continuing to have consultations and using this time to um, 
meet with you over Zoom or by phone and walk you through the process and talk about a timeline that works for you, that's best for you. The, the next step would be creating your embryos. So you'll work with your team, um, like San Diego Fertility Center, and, and come here and create your embryos. At the same time, we'll be screening and uh, looking for a surrogate for you. And the screening preliminary by an agency will consist of reviewing her medical records, a psychological evaluation, um, doing home visits, background checks, as much as we can from an agency's perspective before introducing you to a possible surrogate candidate. And then at that time, you'll get to have a phone call or a Zoom call with her and her partner and get to know her and see if she's the right fit for you. And then your IVF team will evaluate her uterus and uh, conduct the medical screening aspect. Once that's completed, then we meet Rich and start the <clears throat> legal contract process where you'll have an agreement between you and the surrogate. And that process can take three or four weeks or so. And um, from that point on, she can start, once that's finalized, she can start the frozen embryo transfer cycle. Uh, so our team is with you through this entire duration and, and we're guiding you and introducing you to the professionals along with Brilliant Beginnings um, who will be your team for this entire process. Um, so for COVID right now, what we're seeing is that in, in San Diego Fertility Center, the doctors can speak to you about that. What we are seeing a slowdown in medically screening the surrogate at the moment, but by the time you are actually ready to match and, and have a surrogate, then we expect that the centers will be up and, and fully operational at that time. So we use this time right now to have you complete your profile and identify what's most important to you in a surrogate candidate and meet with your, your team virtually and get everything lined up so that as soon as the restrictions start to loosen and are lifted, then we can go right into screenings and treatment cycles. And pregnancy precautions, as we know, Dr. Donishman will speak to COVID and pregnancy. Uh, our surrogates do, of course, follow all of the recommended guidelines for safety during pregnancy, and we'll continue to monitor that for the duration. So <clears throat> they follow all of the the CDC guidelines and wear masks and limit exposure and physicians here, of course, are, are um, managing it as well during pregnancy so that your pregnancy is safe and has as, as few risks as possible. At four, for the birth, I'm, we're all assuming that by the time you have a birth that the, the risk of, of COVID will, will be much limited or even, even gone, right? So, Right now, we're seeing that parents are able to attend most births and be in the hospital for the birth, even with COVID. Um, there are some that are only allowing one parent to come in, at, but we'll work with you in the hospital and your attorney and do as much as we can in order to uh, allow you the, the best possibility of being there for the birth of your baby. And without COVID, of course, you're you're all there for the birth and um, experiencing that joy together and then staying in the room in the hospital with your baby until it's time to leave. Um, travel delays, we will talk about that. We're happy to talk with you individually and about your situation and what your time frame looks like. And then along with Rich, we can uh, navigate what will be best for you in terms of starting your timeline along with any travel delays that are currently in place. Um, so the steps with us, once you're, we're happy to talk with you now, privately set up phone calls and, and review your timeline and what's best for you. And um, then you'll complete your intended parent profile and be on your way to creating your family. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, you know, just a little reminder, if you've got any particular questions, please do use the, 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 the chat um, on at the bottom of your screen. And I know Amy will be very happy at the end to answer any questions or queries around, you know, her agency, her screening process, but also the, the situation in a little bit more detail um, around COVID. 
Um, thank you. Um, so now let's move on to the clinical perspective. And, you know, I'm really delighted to um, ask uh, Saeed Danishman uh, to, to talk us through the situation as it is at the moment. Um, Dr. Danishman is, is an international recognized fertility spe specialist. And really, I think one of the benefits of lockdown is the fact that we've got Dr. Danishman in one place and he's not on a plane somewhere. Um, he really is one of the, the main providers of third party care in the US with patients all over the world. But you know, that said, he never compromises on his individual care that he offers each and, and every one of his patients. And that is something that every single patient, I think, would, would attest to. Um, so yes, I'll hand over to Dr. Danishman. Thank you so much, Helen, for this opportunity, for your kind words uh, to speak to, to future parents. Um, I think it's an important time um, to support one another, to, to really guide and support future parents uh, through this particular journey. Um, and I'm actually excited to be speaking on the heels of the latest uh, guidelines and recommendations from the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, which just came out on April 24th. Um, that particular guideline and recommendation was a change because they had initially um, asked us uh, to have a pause in fertility treatments, and that was mainly as a result of public health concerns and the mitigation strategy in terms of physical distancing and, and other strategies to decrease um, the, the number of cases of COVID-19. But with Friday's announcement and recommendations, they gave a green light to IVF centers and fertility centers to gradually resume all IVF services, including uh, embryo transfers. So this is good news. Um, of course, there were strict recommendations for mitigation strategies and protocols that we have had in place at San Diego Fertility Center now for many weeks to decrease the risk of infection for our patients and for our team members. That includes, for example, uh, every team member has to wear a mask. Every patient, everyone who comes into the office has to wear a mask. Um, we have uh, sanitizing measures uh, throughout uh, the uh, center installed to sanitize service, surfaces after uh, patient visits. So we believe that with the strict measures, we can protect the health of our patients and also resume IVF uh, services in a safe manner. Let's talk about COVID-19 as it relates to IVF. The good news is that there's no evidence of transmission of the virus via sperm, eggs, um, or embryos. We have very good corollaries for this, um, not only for the coronavirus, but for other viruses as well. For example, the hepatitis virus. Um, there's no evidence with the stringent washing protocols that we have in place for sperm, for eggs, um, for that particular risk of transmission uh, through IVF, through in vitro fertilization. A recent study that was published about a week ago looked at men who had been diagnosed with COVID-19, had been infected with the virus, and they, they looked at the semen of those men and they found no evidence of the virus. So that was also reassuring news. But there's never been, with all the studies that have been published, um, any evidence of transmission of the virus via IVF. So we can move forward with IVF and embryo creation with a great deal of safety and confidence. Now, what about pregnancy? Um, the studies so far on pregnancy have been very reassuring. The initial studies came out of actually Wuhan University, were published in the noted uh, British medical journal Lancet. And what they did was they looked at pregnant patients who were admitted to the hospital with severe symptoms of COVID-19. That means in respiratory distress, some of them needed ventilators. And what they did was those investigators looked at amniotic fluid, cord blood, and then they did swabs after the babies were born of the nasal um, passages as well as the oral passages for detection of the virus. And what they found that was that there was no evidence of the virus in cord blood, in amniotic fluid, or with the newborns. That showed that at least at this particular point, there's no evidence of what we call vertical transmission, meaning transmission from the pregnant patient via the placenta or via the pregnancy to the fetus. There had been some reports of newborns having COVID-19, but the belief now is that those particular newborns were infected after birth, either 
via close proximity with the mother or close proximity with other healthcare workers who may have, uh, may have had um, the virus. Now, this is of course in the third trimester. What about um, COVID-19 as it relates to pregnancy in the first and second trimester? Well, we can extrapolate some data from the influenza A epidemic in 2008, from the SARS-CoV-1 epidemic in 2003. And in those particular studies, looking at pregnant patients, when pregnant patients had severe symptoms, and for example, respiratory distress, high fevers, there was a slight increase in the risk of miscarriage um, in the first trimester and a slight increase in the risk of premature birth um, in the third trimester as well. Now, it's important to remember that any type of infection uh, which has as its consequence high fevers, respiratory distress, and other what we call constitutional symptoms has um, can, uh, as a consequence, increase the risk of complications uh, during pregnancy. So this is no different than many other infections which have these particular side effects. Now, what about pregnant patients? Are they more prone to uh, getting the, uh, contracting the virus? And if they do contract the virus, are they more prone to have severe symptoms? Three studies, one from Northwestern University, one from Columbia and Cornell showed that pregnant patients were no more prone to contract the virus. And if they had the virus, they were no more prone to having severe symptoms, severe symptoms meaning high fevers and respiratory distress. In fact, in New York uh, at Columbia, they looked at over 300 patients who were pregnant and they did testing on all of them. And what was surprising is that about 8% of them uh, tested positive for COVID-19. A very small percentage ended up having severe symptoms. The majority, actually over 87%, had more asymptomatic carriers of the virus. Um, so based on those particular studies, it doesn't seem to be the, the case that pregnant patients are more prone or they're more prone to potentially having severe symptoms. Now, if a pregnant patient were to have symptoms, are the medications that are used today uh, able to be used during pregnancy? And the answer is yes. For example, so far, chloroquine, uh, another medication called famotidine, and just recently, there are about 40 clinical trials on an antiviral medication called remdesivir. And we actually had some good um, news yesterday. Uh, and I posted uh, um, those particular uh, updates uh, on our Facebook page. Uh, but the good news yesterday was that remdesivir in at least several clinical trials has been shown to significantly reduce uh, the rate of hospitalization for patients and also decrease the rate of mortality. And that's an antiviral agent that inhibits the replication of the virus. Now, those medications, the good news is, can be used during pregnancy. And once remdesivir is actually available on a more global scale, uh, we think that it's going to have a significant impact on reducing the um, severity of the symptoms, reducing mortality, and the, the rate of hospitalization for patients who are uh, afflicted with COVID-19. So that's good news. Good news also during pregnancy in terms of being able to treat those patients uh, if need be. The other issue is um, there is a race to the vaccine. Uh, and um, I'm happy to note that um, the, the one uh, organization, academic university that has really sprinted the fastest, and we may be the closest, maybe the closest in terms of, of coming up and producing a vaccine that's effective, is right there. Um, uh, where all of you, close to where all of you are, and that's at Oxford University. Um, we posted a video um, just a couple of days ago on Facebook, Dr. Sarah Gilbert and her team, and her amazing team at Oxford University, at the Jenner Institute at Oxford University, which is their vaccinology arm to the university, have created a va vaccine using a common virus called the adenovirus, which comprises about 8% uh, to 10% of the common cold, and they've embedded the spike protein portion, DNA sequence of the COVID-19 virus into the adenovirus, and they're using that as a vector for the vaccine. The initial studies have been so encouraging that um, the Jenner Institute and Dr. Gilbert's team, part of their team, are already negotiating with manufacturers around the globe. So once the studies are out in terms of showing the efficacy of the vaccine, that this particular vaccine could then be 
produce on a global scale billions of doses very, very quickly. Dr. Gilbert believes that the vaccine may be available as soon as September of this year. So this is incredible news, and I think uh, you know, the whole team should be commended. The reason why I think that they are um, ahead of many, many other academic centers or even private institutes is that they have a lot of experience with vaccines against Ebola virus, malaria, and other coronaviruses. So they had already been working on a platform for these particular vaccines, uh, and they were very much ready once uh, they uh, sequenced the DNA of the uh, COVID-19 virus. So overall, really good news in regards to treatment, in regards to a future vaccine. Um, our clinic is open for IVF services. We're going to resume embryo transfers in June. Uh, and of course, we have had the mitigation strategies at the clinic in place for now several weeks. So uh, just a little bit of update in regards to COVID-19 as, as it affects uh, fertility and, and, and pregnancy. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. That's, that's really encouraging. And it's nice to kind of see that there is, there is light coming out to the end of the tunnel. But we're not there yet, but we're heading yeah. there. Great. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Let's now move on to Dr. Chuan. Um, Dr. Chuan is a double certified specialist with incredible experience in complex IVF and third party reproduction. Um, Sandy is in incredibly passionate about family building for patients who hope to become parents through egg donation and surrogacy. Works alongside Dr. Danishman at San Diego Fertility, beautiful San Diego. Um, and together through their, their, for their um, IVF center, really provide cutting edge care um, that really, honestly, I know I said this, this before, but never compromises on compassion. Um, and I think that's what, what we see um, very much through, through uh, San Diego Fertility. So Sandy, do you, are you happy to talk about a um, little bit more of the clinical detail? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I love working with Brilliant Beginnings, love working with all the professionals that um, are here with you today. We've all had such a great collaboration together and it's awesome to be here today. I sound like such a Californian, awesome um, to be here today, to be able to, in these unprecedented times, still give families hope um, in terms of getting to you know, their final goal of, um, you know, having a baby in their arms. And I think that COVID obviously has thrown everyone for a big loop, um, something that I could never have even imagined in my wildest dreams, but here we are. And I think the past month has felt, every day has felt like a month because there's so many changes coming at us all the time. And I think as a clinic, we're constantly responding, you know, um, mid-March, California lockdown, we had ASRM, which told us, okay, you need to suspend active treatments. And so that left a lot of people scrambling to say, you know, what is the right thing to do? We have to keep people safe as a priority, but how do we keep the process going? Because we know a lot of patients are very anxious. And then obviously the shutdown for travel from uh, for international patients is a great impact because about half of our um, patients do come internationally to seek third party reproduction care. So um, we've been very creative in, you know, trying to figure out the ways to keep the process going, the things that we can keep going. Um, and um, so that we don't have a bottleneck later on. And it's great that this past Friday that we had the lift of, you know, suspending active treatment so that we can get on the right path again. But I want to give everybody a little bit in order to understand how COVID may still have an impact. Obviously, you guys are in Europe and the travel, there is still a travel restriction. Um, and I do want to speak to how COVID is going to have some impact and how we're mitigating those um, challenges. However, I want to give you an overview first so that you can understand the things that I'm going to be talking about. So I'll try to be brief in that. And Amy um, already kind of touched upon a little bit about this. Um, I would say it, just to understand third party reproduction, there's three major categories. One is when a woman wants to use her own eggs, create embryos, and then carry um, and have a gestational carrier help her carry the pregnancy, that we call that IVF surrogacy. Um, and then there are women who need an egg donor but want to carry themselves. That's egg donation um, recipients. So EDR is the abbreviation that we use. And then there are patients who need an egg donor and they would like to use a gestational carrier to help them carry the pregnancy. 
surrogacy and that's egg donor surrogacy. So those are the three major categories and the process for each of those are gonna vary slightly. Um, so I think it's important to start with step one, which is have a consult with your physician. Um, during that consultation, it usually is about 45 minutes to an hour where we're gonna learn more about your personal situation because personalized care is very important in this process. We're gonna understand what your needs and desire for your future family you know are and so that we can help you navigate and figure out what is the best way to get to that goal um, and you know and certainly talk about your individual challenges maybe even with pertaining to travel etc at this time um, and then also during that consultation we're going to be talking about pre-cycle testing so everyone that goes through treatment is going to need pre-cycle testing and what that will be depends on the type of treatment that you're needing and that is those two things right now there are no delays in doing that and we've been doing that all along throughout kind of the shutdown um, time frame and I think that you know what people need to understand is that you know even in normal circumstances, this is a process that takes time. We try to be ex as, you know, expedite the process as much as we can because we know our patients are eager. But at the same time, to do something right, you gotta make sure you take all the proper steps. So it's not something you can rush in. There's a lot of work before you get to the final goal. So we keep the, those things going. And as Amy pointed out, that for the patients who are starting their journey right at this point, I think you're not necessarily gonna see a ton of delays from the COVID. I think if you just move along the path, you're probably gonna be on a very similar timeline. Um, but nevertheless, start with that step. And then, you know, if I always kind of split the process for my patients up into digestible pieces. So I talk about, you know, biologically you need sperm, you need eggs, and then you need the uterus to create um, a baby. And so, you know, when you think about sperm, that part is the easiest. We usually have patients, if they're using an egg donor, um, they would potentially travel here um, when it's, um, whenever they're available to just cryopreserve their sperm. And that is something right now that we do have a restriction on because of travel. Well, we've been working very hard, Dr. Donishman and the rest of the doctors here are working really hard to find a path for that. Um, and we have um, some seeds planted. We have a couple of programs that we have that, you know, in Spain, for example, we have a collaborator that will soon be able to, we're finalizing the plan to be able to um, cryopreserve sperm, do all the proper FDA testing and ship the sperm over to the U.S. We're working on a couple of different other locations in um, Europe. We have locations in Asia already and that's been happening for a long time and those obviously because Asia is back to their norm is a feasible option for those patients. So if you're using an egg donor and a surrogate and the only piece that's missing is, um, you know, trying to get the sperm over here, we now have a path that patients can continue on their journey without that obstruction. Hopefully, I'm praying that by summer, hopefully that, you know, or maybe early in the fall that we'll be able to get some of those restrictions lifted. But as we all know, it's impossible to predict kind of how things will look. And so we've just been working hard to find that path. So in terms of the sperm, we would say that um, that's one, one resolution that we've come up with. Um, and then looking, the second piece, which is looking at the eggs. Um, well, if you are a woman who is gonna be using her own eggs, um, I think the first step is to get your testing done so that we can look at your ovarian reserve, look at your status, and because usually after the first consult, um, I will give instructions on getting those tests done so that we can regroup and talk about your prognosis, how things look, how many cycles might we need, when that would look like. Obviously, the patients in the US we have resumed IVF and we have our first group of patients going through in the beginning of May. Now we are limiting the number of cycles. We're not doing as many cycles we know, as we normally do because of the need for these public health protocols that we're implementing. Um, and we are gonna be screening patients for COVID before they um, do their retrieval. So, you know, it's great that there's more testing available now so that we have these options to try to keep patients and staff safe, and we are doing that. But if you're traveling um, from out of the country, then that will have to be on hold, unfortunately, for a time until we know that it's safe for you to, to um, travel. And, um, and that gets a little bit tricky for the patients where this is time sensitive, but we certainly can talk about strategies as much as I would um, 
you know, I do have some patients in certain countries where they may be able to create embryos there and ship them over. We usually like to have the patients have the benefit of the higher success rates in our lab and in the U.S. laboratories in general, but sometimes when patients have a real time sensitivity, if they're 41, 42, that may be a topic of discussion as well um, during our consult. So, um, and so that's for patients who are creating um, embryos using their own eggs. If you are using an egg donor, this is a great time to find your egg donor. Um, and Basically, um, it takes time. This is a big decision. And so most of the time, this takes patients quite some time to figure out who the right candidate is. And in terms of um, the search, um, I think, you know, everybody is a little bit different. And we certainly can point you in the right direction, give you some suggestions as well. And, um, you know, you have a great team there with growing beginnings as experts at doing that and helping people navigate that in the U.S. And so that's step one is finding the donor. And then we're still ongoing doing medical screening um, for every donor and every surrogate. You have to, the overview is medical screening. And then there is, um, you know, medical clearance. And then you go into the legal clearance process. And so we're still doing that. And we are ramping up on that as well, just because during this time, a lot of people haven't been able to travel. But now the U.S. is opening up. We've also been creative in doing remote interviews with our surrogate and egg donor candidates. Um, and so that's been moving along. And so now there's a couple of things that once they're able to get here, we'll need to finish up for the surrogate. But it has really helped us to keep that ball rolling along. Um, so pick your egg donor. So egg donor, uh, egg donor selection, egg donor screening, and then um, legal process, and then usually your egg donor can move into the cycle. Um, the last piece, Amy already spoke to, the uterus, um, about the process of matching with the surrogate. And as far as from our screening aspect, I think we still have some surrogates that may have challenges getting to San Diego to do their screening. But as I mentioned, we're doing remote screening and trying to get their labs done, everything else done close to their home. And then when they're able to get here, we are doing the last piece, which is the uterine evaluation, which is very important in this process. Um, but um, I think right now, with things opening up in a week, when I tell you, maybe a totally different scenario. But right now, it's looking very promising. And I'm seeing that light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and we have, like Dr. Donishman said, most of our patients now are getting geared up, the patients who got canceled, the patients who've had legal clearance, who've been waiting to do treatment for, you know, for the surrogate to get their FETs. We're getting all of that information together. And starting May, we're going to be calendaring people so that hopefully by June, July, that we'll be get, get, getting people caught up. And, but for patients who are um, currently just starting the process, I think you know this is a great time to start your match process because um, I think there's lots of surrogate candidates I've also been on hold and they're waiting and they're ready. Um, and so you're gonna probably potentially have more candidates now um, to, to be able to match with than even in the past when everybody was going. So you wanna get ahead of the bottleneck is what I'm recommending for patients. Um, and I think overall, if you have other questions that are more personalized to you and your situation, we're happy to sit down anytime and talk patients through those. Um, one other question that I get from patients all the time is, well, will you be screening my surrogate? before she starts um, you know, her FET. And I think we do have plans that as we're um, you know, starting patients on doing their FETs, um, that we're gonna offer COVID testing for patients who choose to opt for that. So I think, uh, and the tests are becoming more and more accurate. That's been a concern, but we're exploring a couple of different companies with different methods for rapid turnaround and the one that we feel the most confident with, um, because we know this is a big deal. And we, Dr. Donishana spoke to the fact that there is a slight increased risk of miscarriage. And so we want to make sure that patients feel as confident as possible when they're going to through this, um, you know, this part of their uh, journey that um, they're not going to have any unforeseen, more unforeseen complications than really, you know, needed. So uh, we'll do everything on our end to try to make that possible. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Cindy. That's super helpful. Um, we have had a few questions around embryos and, and timing, which I'll loop back to at the end, if that's okay, and, and um, make sure we get those answered. But thank you. That's so helpful. Okay, so um, now let's look at the legals. 
Um, so uh, we've got Rich Vaughan here, um, who is really one of um, the most exceptional US attorneys that, that we've had the, the privilege to work alongside. Um, Rich and his husband um, are parents by surrogacy and egg donation and is the founding principal at International Fertility Law Group based in LA, um, which is, um, as many of you will know, a leading law practice in the US. Um, Rich himself um, chaired the uh, American Bar Association ART committee for uh, over five years and only stepping down in 2018. Um, and really there isn't very much that Rich doesn't know about the legal side of surrogacy in the US and as many of you may know it's very complex because states differ completely from um, different states differ completely. Um, and really his knowledge is something that we have relied on um, particularly heavily in the, in the, past, in the, in the last few weeks um, and you know, kind of helping to unravel some, some really tricky situations. Um, Rich speaks internationally. Um, his group work with um, many, many international clients. Um, and he is also an advocate for the LGBTQIA um, equality and parenting um, group. So let's hear from Rich on, on where we are in terms of US uh, legals. Thank you, Helen, and thank you, Brilliant Beginnings, for having me on this webinar today. And hi, everybody. Nice to kind of see you. Um, <laughs> Uh, I wanted to just sort of say, in terms of our practice, we do work across the nation, which is why I have a pretty good grasp of what the laws are in each state. And before I get into any of the substantive information, I wanted to echo something that Sandy um, kind of alluded to, which is I, I've been asked recently, what is my advice on surrogacy generally, and what is my advice on surrogacy during these times? And, and my answer is it's the same. Uh, the, the advice is to do your research and, and be prepared, to stay the course and stay calm, and to just be patient. Um, those are the key ingredients to getting through any surrogacy and the key ingredients to getting through this mess that we're in now, which will end. Um, and if you have any doubts about the fact that we are getting to the end of, of this, um, I would encourage you to go to my website. I have a, the good fortune of having a paralegal in um, Beijing. And she used to work for us here in LA. And so she was there in Beijing when all of this broke out. And she's recorded a couple of videos for us that I kind of are referring to, I'm referring to them as videos from the future because she recorded uh, the first video when they first had no new cases. And she recorded the, the next video just a few days ago, now that they are three or so weeks plus uh, uh, post lockdown. So if you're interested in what the future looks like, go to that website and uh, look at her video. In terms of surrogacy during normal times in the US, um, there are, you know, our ultimate goal as your lawyer is to make sure that we have obtained a court order that states you're the legal parents and that your names will go on the birth certificate. And the law that we generally follow is the law of the state where the surrogate gives birth. Um, there are slight variations in the law across the country. Some states have no law at all, but it's allowed because it's not prohibited. Some states have case law only some states have legislative law and some states have both. Um, in terms of the, the core work that you have to do to get through surrogacy, there are four main steps. The first is eventually at some point you'll need to set up an escrow account. And that's a, you know, potentially it's more of a financial service, but it can be done by your lawyer or you can have an independent escrow company hold your escrow account. And the laws on this vary a little bit from state to state. You'll need that escrow account to fund the various fees and expenses that will get paid to your donor and surrogate throughout the process. And typically the agency will manage the payments that are going out of escrow. The second step of the four will be to engage in contracts between your donor and your surrogate. We typically do not start these contracts until the candidates have been medically cleared. Then once they're cleared, we draft for you to see first. Once you are comfortable with the agreement, the document goes to the attorney representing the other uh, candidate, the donor or the surrogate. They are um, required to have a separate attorney in these arrangements. So they'll meet with their attorney and get back to us, let us know if there are any changes that they'd like to discuss. And then we finally finalize that contract. And once that contract is finalized and signed, we send a legal clearance letter to the doctors. The doctor knows that it's okay to proceed. Now with the egg donors, that typically is the end of the work that you'll need to do. So basically just escrow and a contract. 
with the surrogates, you'll need to do two more steps, or at least with our practice, we, we involve you in two more steps of the process. The first one is guardianship documentation. We want you to be thinking about, as future parents, who would be caring for your child if anything happened to you, whether it's uh, through death, incapacity, or guess what? Times of travel bans where you can't get here to the US, you might need a temporary guardian. So we want you to be thinking about not only your long-term guardians, but short-term guardians in the case that you are unable to get here in time for the birth. We also will have the surrogate sign uh, a variety of other documents, uh, whether they are referred to as HIPAA releases or healthcare powers of attorney or guardianship statements. The surrogate will need to sign something in addition to the surrogate contract to give you permission to speak with her doctor, to access her pregnancy records if you need to see them, and to be present at any of the healthcare visits, whether it is in person or even electronically. So these are documents that we will draft for you to supplement the contract. And then the last phase of the legal process is for us to go to court to get a court order for you, as I mentioned earlier. This process varies a little bit from state to state. They generally are divided into two categories of either what we call pre-birth states or post-birth states. The vast majority of the states are pre-birth states where we are allowed to go to court during the pregnancy and obtain a court order signed by the judge before the baby's born. These are referred to as pre-birth orders or PBOs. When we go to this um, trouble of getting the court order, we start actually quite early in the process. We start at 14 weeks of the pregnancy. So once you've cleared the first trimester, we start getting ready for court. And typically by the seventh month of the pregnancy, we have the court order signed. Now, the nice thing is because most of these uh, state laws uh, recognize surrogacy in one form or another, typically you do not need to appear in court and all you'll need to do for the most part is sign documents. There are a few states where you will be required to personally appear. Um, right now in COVID, one nice benefit is that sometimes these personal appearances are now allowed by video. So, uh, you know, we have had some pluses as well. Um, now, when the court order is signed, we send a copy of it to the hospital so they're aware of the uh, court order. We have a conversation with them so that they will know what to do when the birth occurs, so that when the birth occurs, there are no questions, everything runs very smoothly. After birth, it will take approximately two weeks or less to obtain the birth certificate. This timeline can vary a little bit from state to state. And then once you have the birth certificate, you can apply for the child's US passport so you can travel home. Now with COVID, we've had a number of impacts on this process. Contracts tend to be um, not uh, rushed now because there's no need to rush if they can't get into the clinics, although that will change soon. There have been a few provisions that we've looked at a little differently uh, with these contracts, such as with a surrogacy contract. One typical provision is that the surrogate and you agreed or contemplate on up to potentially three transfer attempts within 12 months of signing the contract. We've been changing that to say uh, approximately three attempts within 12 months of starting the first cycle or 12 months of the first transfer because the clinics have been sort of temporarily on hold. Um, some other people have looked at the monthly allowances and maybe holding off on those uh, for the time being, but it looks like with everything getting back to normal fairly soon, we may not have to worry about that particular provision. Um, another impact that COVID has had, and this was referred to earlier by Amy, is that hospitals uh, may have restrictions on who can be allowed into the hospital. Now, I've unfortunately seen a full range of hospital responses ranging from no one allowed in the hospital except for the surrogate who's delivering, to everybody can come in, that's fine. Um, usually just a couple of parents, not the entire family, but uh, I've seen everything in between. And um, so you just have to be prepared for that. And all you can do is really call the labor and delivery department um, right up before the delivery and find out what their current policy is because it's changing frequently. The other impact that COVID has had is on parents coming to the US from other countries. Now with the travel ban, there are some limited exceptions to the travel ban under the presidential proclamation. You have to start working early to build your case to be granted an exception under the presidential proclamation. And we recommend starting approximately six to eight weeks out before you would want to travel or six to eight weeks at a minimum before the due date. Um, and in building your case, you will need to first check on your ESTA or visa to see if it's still valid. In some cases, the ESTAs have been canceled due to the proclamation, but you can get them sort of reinstated through a process where you contact the consulate or the embassy. 
and you basically build your case. You have a letter from your lawyer that states you are the parents or parents to be, and that you qualify for one of the exceptions. There's really only two that we've been able to, to um, have succeed. And one is that you are a parent and that would only be recognized by the consulate if the child has already been born. The other exception is um, a rather general vague one called in, in the national interest of the US. So um, it's important that your lawyer letter indicate that it would be in the interest of the US that you'd be allowed to get here so you can care for your child and also take the child from the hospital so that the healthcare resources here are not overburdened during this public health crisis. And to supplement the lawyer letter, you need a doctor letter or hospital or IVF doctor or obstetrician or even a pediatrician, someone with a medical license essentially, to say that it is in the national interest for the healthcare system to be relieved of the burden of having to care for the child or children. So you need to get here so you can be there for the birth and get home. Um, now with that, if you um, send everything to the local consulate or embassy, they will be sending everything to the State Department in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. makes the final decision and then it goes back to your local consulate or embassy. In cases of emergency where birth is very soon, we've seen them actually turn things around fairly quickly. Um, but if your birth is not for another month or two months, they may not be um, motivated to act urgently because they've got other emergencies they're dealing with. They have lots of U.S. citizens around the world stranded, so they're working on getting them home as well. So they're very burdened at the moment. Um, but if you have an emergency, they will respond. Um, once you send all of this to the consular embassy, be prepared to answer a number of additional questions about any estas or visas you've had, whether they've been denied or revoked in the past, any recent travel you've been on, and you need to answer questions about your plans to quarantine, whether you quarantine before the travel or you'll be quarantining in the U.S. once you arrive. Once you get approved, you will be directed to make your flight reservations and then give that itinerary to the consulate. They will contact Customs and Border Patrol here so that they are aware of your flight itinerary. They will also contact the airport manager where you're flying into so they're aware that you're traveling. And it should be, should be in quotes, um, smooth sailing, although we've had a few that were asked a bunch of questions, um, but most clients have been able to get through without too much hassle. Um, again, be prepared to show information about your quarantine plans, where you're staying, show your rental, your Airbnb or hotel reservations, um, and the more documentation you have, the better. Now, there is potentially one alternative to this, and that is if you can be physically present in a country that is not subject to the travel ban for 14 days before traveling, then you may be allowed to travel. But the travel bans are based on physical presence in a country, not where you are a citizen. So if you can be in a country that is not subject to the travel ban, that might be one easy way to get through. But I, I would caution you, think carefully about that because if the travel bans change, if countries get added to the list and you're in that country, you could get stuck. And then you're dealing with a consulate in a country that's not your own. So it could add some hassle if it doesn't work. Um, I think that's really all that I have. Thank you for having me and I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Wonderful, thank you so much, Rich. Um, we've got a couple of questions, which again, I'll, I'll loop back after uh, Natalie um, brings us around to, to the UK side of things, but Rich, really, really helpful. Great to have that kind of up-to-date information for anyone who's, who's thinking about the next few weeks and what might happen, so thank you. Um, so finally, um, I want to ask Natalie to um, bring us up to date in terms of um, the UK legals. And as many of you will know, um, Natalie um, has led many of, of uh, the much needed changes in, in the UK uh, legal system as far as surrogacy is, is concerned. She's a regular voice on the BBC as well as um, in the corridors of the High Court in, in London and amongst um, those um, those echelons and and she and the legal team at NGA Law have been really working incredibly hard over the last few weeks to help navigate intended parents or new parents who are stranded um, both in the US and abroad um, with their newborns and bring them back help bring them back here to the UK as well as helping to unravel some of the pathway um, for those babies and families that are are going to be coming into the world um, and um, so, you know, let, let's hear from, from, from Natalie. Thank you. 
Brilliant. Oh, thank you. Oh, there you are. Okay. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? <laughs> thank you, Helen. And um, it's lovely to be here. And I, I know from kind of having seen the list of registrants that there's a uh, kind of mixed experience among all of you. I know some of you are expecting babies in the next few months and some of you might be at an earlier stage of the process. Um, but whatever stage you're at now, the, the UK legal side of things very much kicks in as the last part of the, the jigsaw that you need to put together. Um, and I was going to just um, spend my time talking about two main issues that really parents from the UK are facing at the moment. The first of those is bringing your baby home to the UK after he or she is born. Um, and the second of those is then going through the court process to become legal parents in the UK um, as well as in the US. So I'm going to talk through kind of what parents need to do at the moment and how that's all been affected by the, the current COVID crisis. Um, so firstly, looking at um, the process of bringing your baby home once he or she has been born. So hopefully following Richard's advice, you've got your um, permission to travel to the US, you've got there, you've been allowed in the hospital, your baby's been born. Um, I'm sure you'll want to bring them home as soon as possible. And historically, parents from the UK have applied for an American passport for their baby in order to travel back to the UK. Um, and the main reason that they do that is because usually it's a very quick and straightforward process. Um, a child is entitled to an American passport simply by virtue of having been born in the US. Um, and it's a much simpler process than getting UK travel documents. So it's been quite rare historically for parents from the UK to need to apply for a UK passport to travel home. Um, but in mid-March, very suddenly, um, the rules because of the, the current pandemic changed almost overnight in that the American passport office stopped issuing passports for babies born um, through surrogacy and otherwise in the US via their expedited process. So while it's still possible to get an American passport for a child, it takes much longer because it's being dealt with by post. Um, and parents are being told that it will take around eight weeks to get an American passport. Um, so this happened with a number of our clients, um, one of whom who had just had babies born. Um, and so we kind of jumped on this to see if we could find a UK solution to get UK documents to enable travel, which would be quicker than that eight week turnaround for the US passport. Um, so we did a, a bunch of campaigning and, and lobbying work. Um, I wrote a letter to the Home Secretary. We spoke to the Guardian and the Telegraph and on the Today programme. Um, and I'm really pleased to say that the government have been really helpful and very responsive. And we now have a special expedited process for getting an emergency passport for a, a child born through surrogacy in the US if either of the parents is British. So exactly how this process works is quite convoluted because for UK law purposes, the surrogate is always treated as the mother of the child, irrespective of the court order that you have in the States. Um, and if she's married, then her husband or same sex spouse is treated as the other parent. And so British nationality doesn't automatically pass to the child from the biological parents or the intended parents. So so the way of getting an emergency passport, it depends on the specifics of the case. So essentially what the, the process involves is asking the Home Office to either confirm that your child is already British or to make your child British through, the, through a discretionary grant of British nationality. And which of those categories you fall into will depend on the specifics of your situation. Now, historically, where the Home Office has had to grant British nationality, that process has taken six months. But with this new expedited process, these applications are now being turned in and as, around in as little as 24 hours, which is fantastic. Um, so once the Home Office has either confirmed or granted British nationality, there's then this kind of chain of authorisation. So typically British bureaucratic. Um, so the, the Home Office has to authorise the passport office to authorise the local embassy to issue an emergency passport. But if that chain of authorisations happens, what, what that means is that then your local embassy in the States will liaise with you about arranging to issue an emergency UK passport for your baby. And that is a document that it looks like a passport. It's one, a little booklet, the same as your passport but in a different colour um, and it enables you to travel back to the UK via other destinations if that's necessary but it's just valid for that journey so it's not your child's permanent passport but it will get you home and um, so at the mo moment that process is taking between one and two weeks which is pretty quick um, and we've got good contacts to make it to go through very quickly um, so if any of you have babies due imminently, that option is there for you and that will, we've had about half a dozen sets of parents now that have got home successfully through that route. 
Um, obviously, if you're expecting babies a little bit further ahead, it may be that things will change again. And if the US passport office reopens to quick applications, that may be a simpler process than this one. Um, and if there's a similar time frame, it may be that people will go back to applying for US passports. Um, but it's good to know for now that in the current um, situation and if the restrictions continue that this process is there. So um, if Rich can get you into the US, we can get you home. <laughs> it's essentially the message. Um, so the, the second part of the UK legal side of things um, is the application that you'll need to make for the parental order. Um, and obviously one of the big drivers which um, encourages parents from the UK to go to the US for surrogacy is that you have legal certainty in the States. And uh, you know, as Rich has been explaining, you can enter into an agreement with your surrogate, you'll be recognized as the legal parents. Um, but unfortunately, the position in law in the US is not reflected in the position in law in the UK. Um, so as I said earlier, the surrogate will be treated as the legal mother, and if she's married, then her spouse will be the other parent. So in addition to the US legal processes that you have been through, you will also need to apply to the UK Family Court for a parental order in order to become your child's legal parents here. Now, the, the parental order is a solution that's designed specifically for surrogacy cases. These are orders that are only made in respect of surrogate-born children, um, and it's a very well-tested process. Um, we've been doing um, parental order applications in international surrogacy cases for about 12 years now. Um, we've dealt with hundreds of applications. There's never been a parental order application that has been refused in a case like this. Um, and at the end of the process, when the court makes the parental order, they will ask the general register office in the UK to issue your child with a UK birth certificate. So the end document product, if you like, that you receive will be a British birth certificate for your child that confirms that you are the legal parents. And that, if you like, is the final step in your journey of not just conceiving your child, but making sure that they're legally a part of your family, um, just in the way as any other child would be. So in terms of the um, criteria for the parental order, there's a, a number of criteria that the court has to assess. I'm not going to go through them all in detail, but essentially you'll need to put together a, a pack of evidence, which the court will assess. So it usually looks like a kind of fairly fat legal arch file. Um, and some of the issues that need to be addressed in that are the fact that the surrogate consents to the parental order being granted. Um, you have to give quite detailed information about the payments that you made because the law in the UK requires any payments beyond expenses to be authorised by the court. Um, the court will want to have some um, reassurance that the arrangement is an ethical one in which no one has been taken advantage of or exploited in any way. Um, and there can be some quite complicated evidence to give around domicile as well. So um, in order to be eligible for the parental order, you have to be domiciled here. So if you were from somewhere else originally and you've settled in the UK, or if you're British and you're living outside the UK, then those are the situations in which the court will need a bit of information to establish whether you're domiciled. Um, so in terms of eligibility, you have to have a biological connection with your child um, and it's now possible for both single parents and couples to apply as well. So these are all the kinds of issues that will need to be covered in the evidence that the court looks at. So in terms of the process, it's a post-birth court application. It's heard in the family court. Um, traditionally, these applications take around six to 12 months. It's quite a lengthy process. Um, and there are two court hearings before a high court judge and also a welfare assessment, which is carried out by a social worker who's appointed by the court system. At the moment with the, um, the, the pandemic, um, the family court in the UK has been really responsive to kind of managing in a crisis. Um, and we are able to arrange um, court hearings by Skype. Um, and also the, the social worker home visits are being done by FaceTime and Zoom and Skype as well. So the process um, is kind of moving forward, notwithstanding the fact that people can't kind of physically get to court. And for, for many parents, actually, that works much better. It's much more convenient, particularly for parents who are British but live outside the UK. Um, so things are kind of moving forward and there's no delay with that side of things. Um, our team deals with a lot of these applications. Um, I think some years, the majority of the applications that go through the court here in the UK um, and we have a range of different services for parents who both want us to do everything and make it as easy as possible. Um, and with those applications, we can usually get things done in one hearing in around four months. So it's a quicker process. Um, but we also support parents um, who are kind of doing some of the work themselves and going through the traditional process, but they want to do that with support and guidance. Um, so uh, it's you know, largely good news in terms of um, everything still being possible on the UK side of things. Um, we can get you home and we can get parental orders resolved for you. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie.
Um, well, yes, thank you all the speakers. And that kind of brings us to the end of, of the, the formal part of our session. And um, uh, I can see that, that we've had a bunch of questions. Um, so um, get your thinking caps on. Um, I might just go through them kind of in order as, as we've been speaking. So we'll start right from the beginning again in terms of um, you know, the, the, the creating embryos and what we do with that. And so Amy and um, Sandy and Saeed, I think these are, to begin with, just going to be questions um, for you. Um, and I'm very happy I'm keeping an eye on, on the chat box. So forgive me if you see me typing. I am listening. I'm just looking at, at the chat box as well. Um, but one of the first questions that we've had um, is in terms of, of timeline and what that would normally look like um, if we were outside of COVID from um, starting to look for a surrogate, legals, transfer and birth. Um, and I wonder maybe, Amy, that's probably something that you would see from start to finish if you can talk, talk sure. to us about timelines. Sure. The, the initial timeline being matched with a surrogate is typically, depending on the agency, it may be two to six months to allow for identifying the surrogate matching. Uh, once you're matched, she'll have medical evaluation, legal contracts, and then um, the embryo transfer cycle. That's typically around a three-month process. It can be a little sooner, a little bit longer with delays, but allow for about three months for that, and then the pregnancy, if that's achieved on the first transfer. So um, typically from start to finish, then you're looking at um, maybe a year and a few months to a year and a half till the time that you take home your baby. Yeah, great. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, so then in, in terms of thinking about um, the successful transfer and roughly how many times, and this may be a, a question for the clinicians as well, you know, in order to kind of prepare yourself both emotionally and, you know, financially, you know, how many time, how many transfers would typically be sensible to, to be thinking around? Yep, I, I think that, and I think Dr. Josh may have to step away because I think he had a procedure he had to do, but um, so, you know, in terms, when we look at success rates, it really depends on the embryo quality, and so part of that answer really comes down, it has to be very individualized, and so that's part of what you're going to be talking about when you have that consultation with your physician, particularly for a woman who's using her own eggs after you've had your ovarian reserve testing done, we can give you much more information, um, but if I were to speak to egg donation cycles, which usually these are great quality embryos, I think we have about an 80% success rate with a single embryo transfer the first time. However, I still advise patients that to be mentally prepared that it could take more than one transfer. Two to three is a very reasonable number because as um, I give analogies a lot to my patients, I always say that the embryos that we create that get to the blastocyst stage that we can transfer are really like semi-finalists in a little mini marathon that we're going. We're trying to get to the champion, right? But these are semi-finalists and science does have some limitations where we cannot look at an embryo and tell you, yes, that one is definitely your winner versus that one is definitely not going to make it. So there is this natural selection process in which you have have to allow the embryo to be transferred and see if it can prove that it can continue to develop. And there are things where maybe the embryo looks great, but during development, it's kind of like building a home. You could have the right blueprint, but the workers can make a mistake. So developmentally, things can go wrong as well that can you know, eliminate an embryo. And it's really nature's way of keeping you from having an unhealthy pregnancy. So even with egg donor embryos, there are times where they can take two to three transfers. And patients often will ask me, do I need to switch my surrogate? And is it my surrogate? Is it her uterus? And I'm often trying to explain that biologically, usually it's the majority <laughs> of the determining factor is the embryo and not necessarily the uterine cavity or the uterine factor. Because you, women that are surrogates have been screened these are women that have carried their own pregnancies successfully. That's a criteria. Part of our medical screening is looking to see if there are any red flags or things that would make us concerned for either her chance of 
you know, staying pregnant or chance of having complications in pregnancy. So that's part of our protection of the, the intended parents, but also we want to protect the surrogate to make sure that she stays safe. So, so I think it's not usually a uterine factor. And that's why also the contracts, as, you know, Rich um, maybe mentioned, is that usually it's written in for three transfers to account for that. So I do think it's good to be mentally prepared um, that it could take more than one transfer. Wonderful. Thanks, Sandy. Um, okay, now a little bit more on embryos. So we have someone who has uh, frozen embryos in Spain with an anonymous donor. Um, is it possible to bring those to the US um, in non-COVID circumstances, but also potentially for COVID circumstances? So for those situations, we have received embryos created internationally. I think that the US FDA um, you know, does have some strict rules about infectious disease testing. And so I think part of that answer will have to come from what type of testing was done in Spain before the embryos were created. If there are embryos created by a couple who intended to use it for in vitro fertilization, IVF transfer into the woman herself initially, usually I'm able to do retrospective FDA testing because these embryos, the intent was for IVF, so you wouldn't have done the strict FDA testing. Um, and so we can apply for a special license, you know, if it was created for the individual. But when it's an egg donor, then we'll have to look into the specifics of the case to see what was done in Spain, what type of testing was done, and then see if that can happen. But we certainly have received embryos from kind of all over the world, as long as they can be shipped out. That's the other part that would have to be explored depending on the country and the circumstance. Um, in some places, it's much easier than others. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, okay, so this is just again in, in, in terms of timing of everything. And, and the question is around, um, you know, is this a good time to um, start the search for a surrogate, even if um, the embryos have not been um, created and are in place and frozen? Amy, do you want to take that and then sure. jump in the medical part sure. too? Okay. It, well, it's a good time to start definitely start exploring the process and, and talking with the agency creating your profile. Surrogates do want to know that there are embryos soon on the horizon. So if you're going to be having a, a transfer or a retrieval soon within the next couple of months uh, or a few months, then yes, start looking for your surrogate now since that wait time for a surrogate can be several months and that's fine. However, a, a surrogate would rather not wait three, four, or five months for embryos to be created. She'd like to get started as soon as possible. So just keep that in mind with your time frame. But it's a, it's a great time actually right now because as mentioned, there, there may be surrogates that, uh, that are ready to be matched and, and are willing to wait those few months for you to create your embryos. Wonderful. Sandy. Yeah, no, and from the medical perspective, I'm totally in line with Amy, usually, you know, on that recommendation, because I think one is the surrogates wanting to know that there's embryos on the horizon, but I also think that there, sometimes I do have patients where we know that we might have some struggles with their ovarian reserve, and we may need multiple rounds of IVF to create, you know, to get to that viable embryo that has a good chance of implanting, and so I think it's good to get the work of that done first before you're investing, you know, monetarily you know, into also the process of matching with the surrogate. Um, so it just depends on one. But if you're using an egg donor, that's a completely different story, which I think it might be good to go along simultaneously. And we do that often. And we often tell patients, let's create the embryos first, because that gives the surrogate security. Um, and it's a ma faster match process. But a lot of times, if you have an egg donor that you know is going to be moving along swiftly, it makes sense because of that wait time for the match to then get going in parallel. Okay, fabulous, thank you. Okay, again, um, a little bit more on, on frozen embryos. Um, and this is around um, the pre-cycle testing. So if, if somebody has PGS uh, tested frozen embryos, um, do you still need the pre-cycle testing? And th th these are created outside of the US, can you just ship them over? Or is there a need for pre-cycle questioning, uh, uh, testing? If you already have embryos, then the only thing that usually are in question would be 
if the proper infectious disease death testing was done through the FDA. That would be the main thing because I'm no longer trying to evaluate your ability to get embryos, et cetera, and looking at the sperm and all that because the embryos already created. Um, but we would have to then take a good look at the infectious disease testing, the FDA status, and then it's really the logistics of can we get the embryos out? Okay. And this is actually a question that's just come in, um, you know, just directly relating to San Diego fertility is uh, somebody has um, their patients at, at San Diego and been asked to undertake FDA, FDA tests following embryos that were created for their own use, um, yeah. have the kits, do they now actually need to, to do these tests? Yeah. Yes. So if you already have embryos that you created originally for IVF, then it's doing the FDA testing. And as long as the shipments are still able to come to the US, which I don't see any reason that's not been stopped at all. I think we haven't had any trouble with that. Then you will want to complete the kits and then send them back. Um, and then basically your pre-cycle process essentially would be complete. Right. As long as the FDA testing looks good, of course. But. Brilliant, thank you, perfect. Um, and then a very broad brush question around PGS tested embryos. And, and can you talk to any of the success rates around um, PGS tests? I think you, you, you picked up on that earlier. Does that yeah. make sense? Right. I think it's, I think regardless of um, whether they're PGT tested or not, obviously PGT testing can increase the success rates because if you think about it, it's another selection criteria, right? You're, as women get older, especially after age 35, more and more of our embryos are chromosomally abnormal as our eggs age. And particularly after 37, that jumps up even greater. So over 70% of the embryos will be abnormal after age 37. So certainly PGT can improve success rates and lower miscarriage rates. But your individual chance of implantation with a particular embryo is going to depend on some of your pre-cycle testing, your ovarian reserve testing, your own age, uh, even if it's past PGT. Um, and also the lab in which the embryos were created are going to factor in, and that becomes a challenge for me when I'm not familiar, right? It's not a lab that I work in, but we do our best to give patients some general perspective. So that's, again, if you have embryos that are PGT tested and you want to kind of have an idea what your success rates are, that's something else that we would love to look at your medical records um, and then talk you through that in the consultation to give you more specifics, because it's hard to give a broad stroke number. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, that I think covers all of the sort of medical um, or clinical um, side of the questions. Um, one of the questions that we've had, Rich, is in, in relation to um, how long people, well, actually, it's not just Rich, it's maybe, maybe Amy as well, in terms of um, how long intended parents need to actually stay in the US. Um, and I'm assuming um, that is around um, the, the once the baby is born, but potentially even before that, there's been another question around you know, actually getting out to the birth and, and what recommendations would you have in terms of people uh, timing wise to both get out to the US but also stay in the US? Mm -hmm. Rich, you want to take yeah. that one? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I would say that it, you should look at the due date and back up about six to eight weeks to start working on getting your permissions to travel. Um, you know, I, I've been when I've been writing to the embassy and the uh, consulates, I've been suggesting that the parents need two weeks here to quarantine and two weeks prior to that, just in case the birth occurs early, because of course, you know, babies don't always come on the due date. So that's four weeks prior, and it might take two to four weeks of work with the consulate or embassy, depending, uh, to get the permission. And then after the birth, you know, in normal circumstances, three to four weeks would do it. The U.S. passports are being significantly delayed right now, so we're looking at eight to 12 weeks, actually, Natalie, um, although there's been some rumbling that the State Department might be reopening sometime in May, where it's unofficial, so we don't know yet for sure. Um, and if, if the U.S. passport is delayed, then you know the amount of time you have to spend here will be based on how long it takes to get the birth certificate, which is about two weeks, and then however long it takes to get uh, U.K. travel documents to travel home. 
And just to plug in the UK side of that, if you're applying for an emergency UK passport, we've been getting them through in about seven to 10 days. Um, and we've had a couple of cases now where parents haven't been able to get the birth certificate quickly because of delays with offices being open and so on. Um, and we, we have been able to submit other documents like hospital confirmation of the child's identity in the first instance and then send the birth certificate to follow up later. So the, the government here has been quite kind of helpful with, you know, where we don't have all the documents. So the timeline on the UK side is, is pretty quick, actually, at the moment. Yeah, and depending on what the, the home country government will accept as evidence of the birth, uh, other than the birth certificate, some hospitals will produce souvenir birth certificates, documents that you know indicate the birth occurred, and baby footprints, and the baby's name, and the parents' names, and you know some have accepted that. So, great. One of the questions that kind of dovetails with with both of 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 that rich as well as Natalie is in terms of the um, new sort of expedited process for getting travel documentation and passports you know do, do people need to go through a lawyer or are these contacts available and open and accessible to to people outside of lawyers or is is are they particular contacts that that you guys have yeah, I mean, so it's a bit of both. So when um, this whole thing kicked off, we kind of um, encouraged people to contact us if they were expecting babies. So we've got a list of all the babies and when they're due um, that we've kind of been communicating to the Home Office. So what we're doing is kind of trying to get to make sure that the Home Office is aware of the cases that are coming up. So they're kind of primed to help. Um, and that's something that we're doing, you know, you know, whether you're instructing us to help you with the process or not, that's kind of part of our pro bono work. Um, and obviously we've helped to kind of set up this process. So for some parents, they're saying to us, look, can you ha handle the process for us? So we can very definitely do that for you. Um, if you want to handle the process yourselves, then you absolutely can do that as well. Um, it works slightly differently if you're doing it yourself. So the way that you start it is to speak to the local embassy in the first instance, and they will then loop in the home office and the passport office and so on. Um, and I have to say, I have, we haven't seen anybody complete this process yet in the States where they're doing it themselves. We've seen people do it in other countries where surrogate babies are being born. Um, and on the basis of those other countries, it does take a bit longer if you do it that way. Um, but it's very possible to do it without a lawyer. It's not a process that's kind of, you know, unique to the lawyers. We've kind of set it up, you know, to benefit everybody. Yeah, I, I just want to add on to that, just in, in the reverse, you know, in terms of getting here, it is entirely possible for a person to contact the consulate or embassy themselves. Uh, and over the course of the last few weeks, the process that we've developed with the consulates in the State Department, you know, has now been more well-defined. And so they might get a more um, uh, substantive response, but several weeks ago, they weren't getting any responses. So then they were turning to us and then we would contact the consulate. So uh, if they have the desire and the energy and the time <laughs> to, to do it themselves, by all means, I, there's, there's certainly no reason they couldn't. That's brilliant. Thank you. Really helpful. Um, Natalie, one other question in terms of UK passport application. Are you able to talk very briefly through that process? Yeah, and I think if I've seen the question, it's about if the surrogate's not married. Um, so in a case where the surrogates are not married and the biological father is British and was either born in the UK or naturalised, so a bit of a shopping list because it's quite complicated, but in that scenario the baby will be born British. So it's, the, it's a very similar process to the process where you're getting British nationality granted, but the, the bit that's different is what the Home Office is doing is the first step. So the first step will be for the Home Office to confirm that the child is already British um, and they will then authorise the passport office to authorise the embassy to issue an emergency passport. So the first step is for the Home Office to kind of re review all the documents and, and confirm that the child is British. Um, if the child isn't British, then the first step is for them to review similar documents, but then to make the child British. So it's not wildly different in process, and it's that kind of sequence of Home Office, passport office, embassy that seems to be what's necessary to make it work. Beautiful. Great, thank you. Um, okay, I'm just going through my list. So, uh, Rich, another question for you, um, and this is in relation to uh, guardians. And if someone has guardians already set up, but unfortunately they aren't in the US either, what happens? Then you, you set up temporary guardians who okay. can take care of things in the meantime. So typically a, a guardianship designation is meant to be a more permanent 
uh, assignment in case of death or incapacity, but there are you know, concepts of temporary guardians. They are sometimes referred to as temporary guardians, standby guardians. Um, uh, that was another word for it I'm forgetting now, but uh, it's a concept that exists. Okay, and can that be done at the same time as setting up your, your permanent guardians? And is that something people should be thinking about right now? They definitely should be thinking about it, just to have someone in, in mind. Um, if they don't want to put this to writing at the moment, they can wait and see what happens. And, and if they get in, great, they won't need it. But we had someone just yesterday who um, uh, had to do this last minute because they, they hadn't thought about it. So um, you, you can these things can be put together fairly quickly as long as people are available to print and sign a document. Brilliant. Okay. Yeah. Really helpful. Thank you. The question related to that that we keep getting asked is what what happens if parents don't have friends and family in the states who can step in to look after their baby? Is there any kind of provision for anyone else to help in those situations? Well, there's no routine provision for this, but um, we've had uh, in some instances agency personnel have have stepped in to help out. We've had some surrogates step in to help out. You know, those would be, um, you know. Things that need to be considered very carefully. We don't want there to be, you know, liability for the agency or for the the, the surrogate. And there are additional, you know, sort of mental health complications with the surrogate who's all along been planning on giving the baby over to now be caring for the baby. But you know, look, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures, and as long as everyone is well advised, and um, you know, um, then, then I think it, it can happen. We've seen it happen. So, okay, wonderful. Um, then just kind of following on from that, we've had a question that, um, you know, can a surrogate in the US change her mind once a contract is signed? Um, is there any scope for her to do that? <laughs> Anybody can change their mind, right? If they want to. Um, I, I often say that, you know, first of all, you, you need to be matched in a state that is legally suitable for you, where the law is favorable to you as an intended parent. And if your contract complies with the con with the uh, local law, then you, you have the law in your favor. But ultimately, this is a piece of paper, right? It's it's law on paper and a contract on paper. So really, it comes down to the very careful and thorough screening and vetting of the surrogate. The vast majority of times, these things go really, really well. Um, but if the law is in your favor, then chances are that even if she changes her mind, um, she's not going to have much luck. We had a case in California, of all places, just a few years ago. Uh, where the surrogate did sort of change her mind. Uh, she was pregnant with triplets. They had agreed that if there were triplets, they would reduce. She refused. Uh, they went ahead with the pregnancy, and then she said, oh, well, you can have one, and I'll take two. Um, and then uh, this wasn't my case, uh, just reporting the facts. But um, then it came time for the court process, and she uh, did not agree with the petition. But the judge reviewed the facts and said, sorry, you signed a contract compliant with local law and prior to the transfer you said you would not be the parent so you, you can't change your mind. So we have some good precedent here uh, for that kind of ruling. So it's highly unlikely, highly, highly, highly unlikely. Yeah. Amy, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, sure, that was not my case either. Um, but uh, yeah, we, in, in screening and vetting surrogates, it's you know, and having been a surrogate myself, I mean, what we hear the most is surrogates are so excited to, to have you take your baby and they really are not interested in having another baby. That's part of uh, the conversation when they apply, when they have their psychological screening, as well as when you meet her and uh, have that phone call with her. So it's um, discussed over and over and over again, her motivation for doing this. And she really the most important thing for her is to hand that baby over to you and, and we even have surrogates who are afraid that you won't we won't take your baby home and, and she'll be she'll be left with it with taking care of it so you know it's really about a, a relationship of trust and and respect and uh, when you meet your surrogate over the phone and see her profile you really initially should have that feeling and and if you don't then you want to look at another surrogate yeah, I would just like to add that, that this question is one of the most common questions I get from intended parents. Mm -hmm. And one of the most common questions I get from surrogates are, are you sure they're going to take the baby? Right. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 And I think that's the same all over the world, certainly here in the UK. Yeah. Thank you. 
Um, we've got a couple of other um, questions for, for Sandy here um, that have come in. Um, one of them is around um, the, uh, is, is sperm quality a significant factor um, uh, in terms of age um, for embryo creation? So I think that this is where the unfair biology continues. The men usually do not have the ticking clock. Um, and so in general, prior to age 50, we do not see any evidence of a significant impact of age on sperm quality. Although lifestyle can definitely have more of an impact because sperm is produced and then stored before it comes into the world. And so environmental, factors, you know, like smoking, over drinking, pollution, just living in polluted environments can, pesticides can have more of an impact on sperm quality than even age. And so when we do the consults, I do talk through patients through how to just optimize everything for themselves. Um, but after age 50, there is some research that shows that there could be a um, slight increase in chromosomal abnormalities, just like we see in the egg. Um, but that's, you know, after age 50. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and then one more question. Um, is the correlation between embryo grade, is there a correlation between embryo grade and chromosomal abnormalities? Right. So, and that's a really common question. Can you look at an embryo and tell if it's chromosomally abnormal? And I think the reason why we need PGT is because exactly because you cannot correlate it. And they've done research studies to try to look at um, morphology. So the physical appearance of the embryo um, and see if it correlates with chromosomal abnormality. And there has not been shown to be an, a correlation. <clears throat> I think that and then that's the the hard the hardest part is sometimes you get a beautiful looking blastocyst and it comes back abnormal and it's the fair quality one or the poor quality one that comes back normal, and that that can be challenging because you know obviously we want both um, you know factors to be present to improve the chance of success but no it doesn't and that's why PGT becomes such an important factor in the screen. Okay, brilliant. Well, that kind of wraps up all of the questions. I'm going to just have a really quick scroll to make sure that I haven't missed anything and I don't think I have. Um, I mean, just to say, you know, you can, everybody can see how complex this process is, but, you know, really with a team, um, like all of the speakers that, that you have, then, and actually, you know, that if something does go off piste, which it will, um, surrogacy is a long journey, but so having people around you with the experience that some of these speakers have is, is really, um, you know, second to none. And one of the things that, that, you know, one of the reasons we set up Brilliant Beginnings was really to make sure that we were able to pull together a team of people who were going to be able to help everyone achieve, you know, their family building plans, you know, in, 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 in clear sight of the fact that things are never going to go to plan and you need people to help you along the way. Um, it's a big maze um, and putting the pieces of the puzzle together, you know, something that, that we love helping people to do. Um, and, you know, I think, you, you know, it's, it's safe to say that, that uh, you know, we're very, very grateful for um, the team in the US that, that are doing the, the amazing things that they do. Um, so I think unless I'm just checking that there are no more questions, then I just want to say thank you ever so much for all of you um, in your homes who um, have welcomed all of the speakers um, there and um, we're just thrilled to have had this time together. Um, we are going to upload this, um, hopefully on our YouTube channel. Um, again, we'll send everybody links to that once that's done. Um, we'll also send you contact details for all of the speakers here, so you do feel free to, to follow up with them. Um, and then, of course, you know, do be in touch with us at Brilliant Beginnings if you've got any questions or queries that, that we can help you with. Um, and of course, you know, just take care of yourselves and be safe. And um, we are really hopeful that we'll get to see you all face to face um, in, in the not too distant future. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.